our presenter. Yes, sir. Senator from Randolph. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, I, I, I kind of picked up on the, the, the first time I'd heard, it wasn't really my first question, but um, given um, uh, the current environment, uh, particularly in one political party in opposition to uh, grooming and pedophilia and all of that, you, you wanted to bring in the idea that we have a lot of uh, under 12-year-old girls who've been forced into marriage. and. West Virginia, uh, presumably against their will, ordered so by a judge. Do you happen to have any numbers to sort of back up the idea that we're forcing 11 and 10 year olds into marriage in West Virginia? No, sir, I don't mean to suggest that, just that that law still exists on our books. Uh, do you think there's even one 11 year old girl that's been forced into marriage in West Virginia today? I I could only speak for Montegoya County, and I would suggest that does not exist. Okay, so we really can just set that particular thing aside, I think, then, right? Because it doesn't even exist in West Virginia. Um, do you not see that this uh, might actually exist for a reason in, in the sense that if I walk into, uh, uh, you know, the kitchen and my wife is doing the dishes and I, and I put a hand on my wife and she turns around and sees that it's me, she may have one response, um, but if she turns around and sees that it's someone she's never met before, she might have a completely different response. Within the West Virginia Code, the requirement that would need to be met for that to rise to the level of a criminal offense would be a need for forcible compulsion on your part. Otherwise, that would not rise to a criminal offense. Uh, I think when we looked at this before, the, the forcible compulsion element that you're sort of putting out there wasn't, um, wasn't really a part of the consideration. As I understood it, as it was explained at the time, um, a husband putting his uh, hands on his wife or wife putting her hands on a husband in, in any sexual uh, way would have been a violation of the law that we examined. Um, I, I, just to correct you particularly, West Virginia Code 618B7, subparagraph A1, has always required the element of forcible compulsion on the perpetrator. And so that situation would only um, rise to the level of a criminal offense if you used forcible compulsion on your wife and during that force subjected her to sexual contact. So you're saying this is never, because it's not the way it was, again, not the way it was explained, this is never applied in cases where um, you uh, touch your wife or your wife touches you in a way that involves, um, you know, sexual touching. Uh, only if after they say don't do that and you continue doing that in some way or in some way they indicate that you're not to do that. So the implied in a marriage contract is, I, I assume there's probably very few people, probably about as many as a 10 or 11 year olds getting married in West Virginia that enter into a marriage contract without understanding that sex might well be a part of it. So there is something of an implied uh, contract there that there's going to be certain benefits to being married uh, I don't think very many people would get married if they thought it wasn't going to work that way. Uh, but you're saying that none of that touching would rise to any level of criminal offense under any circumstances unless you forced that touching. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that pursuant to sexual abuse in the first degree, which I think is what you are describing, there would have to be an element of forcible compulsion, um, or the victim could be physically helpless or incapacitated. Um, which would also rise to the level of a criminal offense. You're, you're citing one section of code, but you mentioned before that this is actually sprinkled throughout our code. You're saying there's nowhere in any of our code that would uh, re not require uh, the scenario that I'm saying. You, could, you can still touch your wife or your wife can touch you any way they want until you say no. Well, I mean, there's lots of reasons and there's lots of ways for a victim to um, convey their lack of consent to some type of sexual touching or sexual intercourse without actually saying the words no. So I guess what I mean, you, you say you want to move the, remove the barrier. If I come over there and touch you in any way, I'm pretty much committing a crime, aren't I? Well, if it's an unwanted touching, I would say yes. I'm assuming you don't want it. I'm saying if I just go up to strange people on the street, man or woman, and touch them in certain ways, it's already a crime. They don't have to tell me no, it's already a crime. That's true, Okay, yes. so you do want to leave a barrier up that says within marriage, that's not a crime. 
I'm not sure I understand that question. Well, you said it has to be forcible if it's inside of a marriage. If I go up on the street and, and approach someone, I'm not using force, I'm just reaching out my hand and touching them, that would be a crime. Um, I think you may be describing battery. Um, the forcible I'm not talking, I'm talking about in a sexual way. Okay. That forcible compulsion, the requirement for forcible compulsion exists in any um, prosecution of a se what I'm describing as a sexual abuse in the first degree. So you're saying people can go around on the street right now and touch people sexually as long as they don't force it? Well, I'm saying it would certainly depend on the particular case. The reason for their touching, um, whether it was for sexual gratification, um, if it's someone maybe slipping on ice and touching someone, it may not rise to the level of a criminal offense. I think every single circumstance is different. And, and I'm saying, I'm assuming it is for a sexual gratification purpose. That's a crime, isn't it? Yes, sir. And you want to make it a crime inside of marriage too, right? I don't think there should be any distinction drawn simply okay. because of so, marriage. When we throw out this forcible this or forcible that, that's not really the way it is. You want to make it a crime to do inside of a marriage what would be a crime to do outside of a marriage, even though married partners assume because of it's, it's part of the implied contract of marriage that those kinds of things are going to be okay. Would, would it be okay or would it change anything? I asked this last year. If we just put a check box for each spouse on a marriage license, I consent to being touched by my spouse. And then that would be no longer implied. It would be a very explicit consent. And if they didn't check that box, I suspect they probably wouldn't have a marriage. But would that solve your problem? I don't think you can consent to be the victim of a crime in perpetuity. Well, I, <laughs> I don't either, but I don't think this is a crime. Um, I think if you actually are talking about real force, yes, it's a crime. If you're talking about the same kinds of things, which you want to remove the barrier between what a person might do on the street and what a person might do in their, their house with their spouse, th these are completely different circumstances. Um, and I think that that's, that's one part of it. Um, the other thing is how long, you know, right now somebody can report a, a sexual offense years later and that crime can be prosecuted. We already have a, a problem in this state and in other states where um, as soon as you go to divorce court, there's suddenly all the times that your spouse abused you verbally and physically and mentally and all of that stuff from years ago get dredged up. You know, how is a spouse going to deal with the idea that now a part of the divorce proceedings is going to be the five years ago that you came downstairs and you laid your hands on you? And she didn't say anything at the time, but five years later in court, in, in divorce court, she says, I didn't want that. That was a forcible touching five years ago. What stops that? I think criminal investigations deal with that type of question often and in many different circumstances, especially within sexual offenses, especially within investigations of sexual offenses. Sometimes we have children that don't report those for years. Sometimes we have victims that don't report their crime until they are free from the perpetrators. And so I think that just needs to be viewed just like any other criminal investigation. Um, part of the investigation and a decision of law enforcement or prosecutors to be made within the totality of the circumstances in each and every case. Um, a circumstance like that is obviously a he said, she said kind of a thing, but this is a divorce court we're talking about. We already see the whole boatload of everything brought into divorce court if they think it'll give them an advantage. You don't think this is going to be a problem that incidents from two years ago, three years ago, ten years ago are going to be a part of the divorce proceedings now? And it doesn't matter if there's a criminal conviction, it's going to go into family court where this accusation is made. Well, I think that those are investigated by law enforcement from time to time um, where there is a delay and where there, the investigation needs to um, identify or locate corroborating evidence. Oftentimes it is a he said, she said situation, but it needs to be viewed in the, to the totality of the circumstances. And so I can't speak to what happens in divorce court. I'm only speaking about whether facts or circumstances rise to the level of a criminal prosecution. Well, I think the accusations are enough, especially in a divorce court proceeding. And I think that this is the kind of thing that's going to do a great deal of damage and probably not solve any problems. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions for our presenter? Senator or delegate from Fayette. 